Hi, I'm Joseph Feraldi. I want to thank you for joining us here at Bayside Chapel Online. Our prayer is that today's service will be a blessing to you, that it will encourage you in your journey with Jesus Christ, and it will help you to see all that God has in store for you. We would love to hear from you on how God is using this ministry to bless you, and we'd love the opportunity to pray for you. Just send us an email at amen at baysidechapel.org. Remember that you can stay in touch with us at any time. Just visit the App Store and search for our app at Bayside Chapel of NJ. Also, if God is using this ministry to bless you, we'd like to give you the opportunity to partner with us financially. Simply go online to BaysideChapel.org or use the Bayside Chapel app and choose whatever option works best for you. Enjoy today's message. you just love a really good cop show? I know, not the way you probably thought I'd start a sermon. Don't you like a good crime drama or, or legal drama? See, from a young age, I've always loved them. Things like cops, going back to NYPD Blue in the 90s, Hawaii Five-0, and then The Shield, and then it was Blue Bloods. Now, one that I never really watched was one that Laura introduced me to when uh, we were dating, and that was Law & Order. Now, I didn't realize when when I'd watch a couple episodes of Law & Order that there were almost 500 episodes of Law & Order. And that's not including Law & Order Special Victims Unit, which had over 500 episodes separately, right? It seems like there's no end in sight with these kinds of TV shows. See, we have this longing for the law to catch criminals and for the courts to make sure that order is restored. And this longing is what we'd call a longing for justice, a desire to see the bad guys get What's coming? A desire uh, to see vengeance just rain down on the guilty. But is that really what justice looks like? Is this the kind of justice that we see in scripture when it says that the Lord is a God of justice, when it says that God loves justice or that his ways are justice? See, biblical justice actually looks quite different from our Western understanding of justice. See, our view of justice in the West focuses on how things should be done, right? How uh, laws or or rules should be enforced and how a, a lawbreaker should be punished. But the biblical understanding of justice doesn't necessarily just focus on how things should be done, but rather on what life should be like. And see, when you read about justice in the Old Testament, you learn that it's not so much to do with enforcing laws, but it has to do with enhancing life. Our Western view is enforcing laws, but the biblical view of justice is enhancing life, bringing it back to the way God intended from creation. See, the purpose of biblical justice is always, always to restore what's been damaged and corrupted by sin, and by evil. And this is so much different from our vengeance based understanding of justice, right? The, the one that, kind of, that wants to seek and, and punish evildoers. But separate from that is God's justice, his restorative justice, his redemptive justice that desires to make all people and all things complete and whole. And there's no better example of this kind of justice in action than looking at Jesus himself. Now, Matthew 12 gives us a little peek into what biblical justice looks like. And so I just want us to kind of uh, get our minds adjusted to to understanding justice um, as it's intended in scripture. So let's look at this little passage in Matthew chapter 12. It says this in, in verse nine, Matthew chapter 12, it says, he, Jesus, went on from there and entered their synagogue. And a man was there with a withered hand. And they, the religious leaders, asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So that they might accuse him. He said to them, which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, 
will not take hold of it and lift it out. Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out and it was restored. Healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. And many followed him. And he healed them all and ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. So 700 years before Christ, God gave Isaiah and the nation of Israel the promise of a Messiah who'd bring forth God's justice in a way that the world has never seen. And this is what Matthew quotes in verse 18. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory. And in his name, the Gentiles will hope. See, do you see what justice looks like then, according to the Bible? See, justice is restoring a man's withered hand. It's making whole that which is broken or damaged. It's healing a person's body, soul, and spirit. It's setting right everything that went wrong. So what we're going to learn today is that only Jesus can make right all we've made wrong. Only Jesus. Only Jesus can right all the wrongs caused by our sin. Only Jesus can undo all the damage caused by our rebellion. Only Jesus can vanquish the evil caused by Satan. Only Jesus can make right all that we've made wrong. And the passage we're going to look back on and explore a bit bit further this morning. We're kind of reverse engineering our way back to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 42 is the passage uh, that we're looking at, and that's actually the passage that was quoted in Matthew chapter 12. Now, Isaiah 42 verses 1 through 9 is uh, the first of uh, four what are called servant songs in the book of Isaiah. There are these different servant songs uh, in in Isaiah, and, and they're named that um, because of a particular servant. See, in the Old Testament, uh, God Uh, called Israel to be his servant nation, to be a light to the people, to bring his blessing and his goodness to others. And then he also called certain people to be his his servant people like Abraham and and Moses. But now in Isaiah 42, Isaiah introduces us uh, to a new individual, a unique person, a special servant, one God affectionately, affectionately calls my servant. See, 700 years before Jesus stepped into human history, Isaiah foretold of uh, various aspects of, of this servant's character, of his, of his passion, of his purpose, of his mission. So in the coming weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to explore these different servant songs that we see in Isaiah. And we're going to get to view Easter through the lens of these Old Testament prophecies about Jesus. So today's text is Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 9. And I'm going to read scripture, so I'm going to ask if everybody could stand for the reading of God's word. Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 9. Listen as I read along. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Thus says God, the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. 
I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare before they spring forth. I tell you of them. This is God's word. Father, I pray that you would illuminate your scripture for us this morning. Lord, that you would reveal to us exactly what it is you want us to walk away with today, Lord, and that we would leave loving you even more, appreciating you even more for who you are and what you've done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Now, a little bit of a context here for, for Isaiah as a whole. Isaiah, um, mentioned it before, Isaiah uh, wrote this, um, his book around 700 B.C. Um, and he, he wrote primarily to warn the people of Israel because they were failing uh, to hold up their side of, of the covenant. And, and, and he's warning Israel that if they're going to persist... In their sin, if they're going to persist in oppressing the needy and the ones that God had called them to care for and love and serve, if they're going to continue to neglect the weak and the disadvantaged, if they remain evil and rebellious, they're going to experience God's judgment. See, God called Israel to be a light to the nations. His, they were supposed to be his set-apart people to represent him to the rest of the world, but they were so caught up in idolatry. They were worshiping fake gods. They were living for themselves. They were living as if they were living completely independently of God, and they were perpetuating all the evils around them. And yet, and yet, in spite of of all of that, in spite of their failure, God remains true to his promise to bring justice, to bring his justice, his, his blueprint for humanity from heaven down to earth to right all the wrongs that we've made. He sent his servant, his very own son, to restore our withered hands and our broken hearts. So the first four verses of Isaiah chapter 42 show us just how gentle and humble a savior we really have. And what we learn in the first four verses is that Jesus is gentle enough to restore the broken. Jesus is gentle enough to restore the broken. Now, by the time we get to chapter 42 in, in Isaiah, you have to realize that at this point, the people of Israel are in exile. Um, they're panicking, they're, they're distressed, they're, they're questioning God, they're doubting God, they're, they're wondering uh, why they're not experiencing his faithfulness, his goodness, uh, his justice. And then you get to chapter 41, and then you see God defending his sovereignty to, to the people of Israel. He's defending his justice, his ways, his character. And God basically tells them, hey, listen, you guys chose idolatry over faithfulness to me, and that led to your exile. So don't forget that I'm the one who creates history. Don't forget that I'm the one who sustains history. Don't forget that I'm the one who carries history out and I steer it. You don't have any leaders that are wise enough to help you, to look up to. You don't have any godly counselors around you. So chapter 41 then ends on this really dark, bleak, depressing note, right? It seems as though God's people are left to their own hopeless and, and helpless and powerless devices. So despair is setting in. Depression is, a national, is at a national high, but then comes the very First verse of chapter 42, verse 1. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. See, the Israelites have no one who can help them. No one. They didn't do anything to deserve any help whatsoever from God. After all, he's been warning them for hundreds and hundreds of years that the very thing that they're experiencing now was inevitable if they didn't turn from their own rebellion and their own wickedness and their own oppressive ways. But God is faithful. He hasn't left his children. Despite all the appearances, despite what things seemed like in the midst of these painful circumstances, God has not forgotten his children. He hasn't neglected them. God calls attention 
to himself. And he answers their cries with a command for them to behold. That's, that's, a, that's a command when he says, behold, my servant. He's saying, God's saying, listen up, pay attention. This is my servant. The one who's going to do everything that Adam, uh, he's going to undo everything that Adam did with the sin and the fall. He's going he's to succeed where Israel failed. He's going to succeed where every other person has failed. Behold, this is my servant. If you think I've forgotten you, behold, I have not forgotten you. Pay attention to this servant I'm going about to tell you about. He's saying, I'm sending you my chosen one. The one I uphold. He's coming to accomplish my will on earth and I'm going to strengthen him and I'm going to sustain him no matter how difficult his life might be, no matter the obstacles he'll face, no matter how great the opposition, nothing is going to defeat my servant and nothing is going to keep him from doing my will. He's going to be empowered. He's going to be completely energized by my spirit to do what I'm calling him to do. And what am I calling him to do? I'm calling him to bring forth justice to the nations. See, God's plan from the beginning was to extend his grace and his justice beyond Israel to all the nations of the earth. It wasn't intended to just stop at Israel, right? It's not just a matter of God restoring Israel and punishing everybody who oppressed or persecuted Israel. God's plan of restoration is for all people, even the oppressors. So when it says to bring forth justice to the nations, it means to make things the way they ought to be, to right all the wrongs that have ever been made. To bring forth justice to the nations also means making all things right in the world, reversing all of the negative, reversing the pain, reversing the grief, reversing the loneliness, reversing the fear, the evil, the depression, the sin, and getting the world back to the way God created it to be. And he's going to accomplish all of this through his servant, his chosen one. And unlike the domineering and selfish kings that Israel knew, unlike the power-hungry, vicious, and corrupt leaders that we're all familiar with, God's servant is going to be different. He's going to be a leader like no other. And we start to see a little bit of what he's going to be like in verse 2. It says this, He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard, in the street. See, unlike the attention-seeking, empire-building authorities who call attention to themselves, God's servant is doing just the opposite. He's not going to use his voice to establish his authority. Just like we saw in Matthew 12, he healed all the people, and then what did Jesus tell them? He said, go and tell everybody what I did. No. He said, don't tell anybody. He didn't care about the fame. He didn't go around crying out in frustration or screaming for attention. He didn't demand loyalty through violence. He didn't demand loyalty through force. He didn't care about giving speeches. He didn't care about grabbing the headlines. He's, he wasn't interested in, in riots and in uprisings and in revolts. Instead, this servant is going to be humble. He's going to be meek. He's gentle. Verse 3. I love this verse. A bruised reed he will not break. And a faintly burning wick, he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. What a beautiful picture this is of the meekness and gentleness and kindness of Jesus. A bruised reed, he will not break. In Isaiah's day, reeds were, were common, so common that they were used uh, to make everyday objects. So common that if the fibers were, were bruised or, or bent in any which way, they were just tossed in the trash. Right? They, they were useless. They could easily be replaced. Then he says, a faintly burning wick he will not quench. Now this is here as a picture of, of an oil lamp. Right? When the oil in the lamp has been consumed, um, there's just smoke. There's really not a whole lot of light left because it's flickering out. Right? So instead of producing light, it's producing smoke. The purpose for creating the light had ended. So bruised reeds then and faintly burning wicks in this passage represent broken people. That's the picture here. A bruised reed he will not break. And a faintly burning wick he will not quench. 
the broken people, the poor, the needy, the hurting, the outcast, the abused, the rejected, the oppressed, the abandoned, the doubting, the guilty, the shameful, the afraid, and the traumatized. Jesus handles us with such grace and gentleness. I'm pretty sure that I covered every single one of us in this room with all those descriptions. Right? How often we feel like bruised reeds or faintly burning wicks, and yet Jesus is gentle. In our sin-cursed world, we're, we're frail humans. We are. We're broken. Now, we're not going to freely admit this. We sure aren't going to go on social media and post and tell all our friends and family just how broken we really are. And we put a front because we want to project an image that we want to be known for. And though we've built up walls to keep people out, we've done a really good job at that, whether it's because we've been hurt too many times, whether it's because we've been abused, taken advantage of, or sinned against, whatever we do, Jesus sees past all of that. He sees past those walls. He sees the bruising of our hearts. He sees the the flickering of our hope. And he enters into it. And he whispers words of gospel power right into our lives because that's exactly the kind of thing that Jesus does. That's exactly what he did for others. That's exactly what he promises to do for us. Just look at his ministry. Jesus said to the paralyzed man, have courage, son. Your sins are forgiven you. Jesus said to the bleeding woman, have courage, daughter, your faith has saved you. Then Jesus said to the grieving widow who buried her son, he said, don't weep. And then he proceeds to raise her son from the dead. When Jesus saw the crowds of broken people, he had compassion on them because they were harassed, because they were hopeless, because they were helpless, as if they were like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus is gentle with the weak, the sick, the hungry, the blind, the grieving, and the repentant. Jesus embraces us. He runs out to meet us, and he welcomes us back home. And Jesus is pouring his gentle words of love and kindness and compassion into your very soul this very moment. I don't know what you came in here with. I don't know what you feel bruised or about or what's flickering in your life. But at this very moment, Jesus is assuring you of his grace, of his mercy, of his kindness, of his love, of his compassion. And he's determined. He will not stop until he's established his kingdom far and wide. And that's exactly what we see in verse four. It says, he will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth. And the coastlands wait for his law. See, though we're quick to get tired, though we're so easily discouraged and so easily beaten and broken, Jesus is persistent. He doesn't grow weary. He doesn't get tired. He doesn't faint. He does not get exhausted in his mission to make right all the wrongs that we've made. And he starts by pursuing us. That's how he begins to make right all the wrongs, is by pursuing us and restoring us. Jesus is gentle enough to restore the broken. And then what we see in the next verses is that Jesus is not only gentle enough to restore the broken, but Jesus is strong enough to redeem the lost. Jesus is strong enough to redeem the lost. So starting in verse 5, The language shifts a little bit. Now we see God addressing the servant directly. Verse five, thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. See, God's reminding us of his incredible power and his unlimited abilities in case we somehow forget that Jesus is both all loving and all powerful. He's both of those things perfectly. Verse six, I am the Lord. 
I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations. See, in the original covenant that God had made with Israel, the people of Israel broke that covenant relationship and they rejected their role to be the servant nation who would shine the light of God's justice to the rest of the earth. So instead of canceling the old covenant, which God had every right to do, he gave them a new covenant in the person of this new servant who we know as the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a covenant not just for Israel. This is a covenant for all people. And Jesus himself is the new covenant. Notice the language. It says, I will give you, God speaking to Jesus, I will give you as a covenant for the people. You are the covenant. I will give you as a light for the nations. And that's what we, sell, that's what we uh, remember when we do communion, when we observe communion as a church family. We're remembering that new covenant that Jesus inaugurated with his death and his burial and his resurrection and his ascension. So Jesus is able to do everything that God says is going to be done. In verse 7, he says this. The servant is coming to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. See, the biggest part of Jesus making right, all that we've made wrong, is his work of redemption. His work of redeeming us from our bondage to sin, of freeing us from prisons of injustice, our prisons of addiction, our prisons of crippling anxiety and overwhelming depression, our our prisons of sorrow and grief and hate and anger and pain and frustration. Jesus redeems us from that. Verse eight, I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Behold. There's that word behold again. He starts with that in verse 1, and he ends with it in verse 9. Behold. Listen. Pay attention. The former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you them. See, God's saying, I am doing a whole new work in this servant, in my servant, my chosen one, my gentle one, my humble one, one who is just like me. He is going to bring justice to the world of injustice. He's going to bring peace to our lives of chaos. He's going to bring joy to replace all of our sorrow. He's going to replace our hopelessness with his purpose. And ultimately, he's exchanging our death with his life. Jesus is gentle enough to restore the broken, and he's strong enough to redeem the lost. And we know that this redemption was made possible only through his blood, by Jesus taking on himself all of our sin, all of our rebellion, all of our injustice that we caused. He took it all upon himself so that he could bring his perfect justice into our lives, into our hearts, to redeem us, to give us new life, to save us, and then to bring that justice so we could be then extensions of his justice in our homes, in our churches, in our communities, and across the world. We are to be instruments of his justice of making right everything that sin has made wrong. He's gentle enough to restore you if you're broken. He's strong enough to redeem you if you're lost. So where are you in that? Do you feel broken? Do you feel damaged? Are you hurting? Do you feel lost? Realize that Jesus is running toward you at this very moment. He is always pursuing you. He runs to the poor, he runs to the marginalized, he runs to the outcasts, he runs to those who are disadvantaged, he runs to those who are disabled, he runs to the sick, he runs to the widows, he runs to the orphans, he runs to the sinners. He's meek and humble and gentle. He's not harsh, he's not reactionary, he's not easily exasperated. We don't have to fear going to him with our pains, with our sorrows, with our sins. 
He's the most understanding person in the universe. And see, his posture is not one of pointing the finger at us saying, I told you so. His posture is one of opening his arms to embrace us and welcome us. Thank God that Jesus doesn't cringe at our sin, at our messiness, at the chaos of our minds and hearts, right? Because it's that kind of embrace that he loves. A pastor named Dane Ortland wrote a book called Gentle and Lowly, uh, taking that passage in Matthew where Jesus says, I am gentle and lowly. Listen to uh, what Dane Ortland writes. He says this about Jesus. He says, what he is, he does. He cannot act any other way. His life proves his heart. When the leper says, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean, Jesus immediately stretches out his hand and touches him with the words, I will be clean. The leper was asking about Jesus' deepest desire, and Jesus revealed his deepest desire by healing him. When a group of men bring their paralyzed friend to Jesus, Jesus cannot even wait for them to ask him for what they want. It says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Before they could open their mouths to ask for help, Jesus couldn't stop himself. Words of reassurance and calm tumbled out. Traveling from town to town, he saw the crowds and he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless. So he teaches them and he heals their diseases. Simply seeing the helplessness of the throngs pity ignites within him this compassion comes in waves over and over again in Christ's ministry driving him to heal the sick feed the hungry teach the crowds and wipe away the tears of the bereaved this compassion reflects the deepest heart of Christ and what is his deepest anguish the anguish of others what drew his heart out to the point of tears the tears of others Time and again, it's the morally disgusting, the socially reviled, the inexcusable and undeserving who do not simply receive Christ's mercy, but to whom Christ most naturally gravitates. He is, by his own enemy's testimony, the friend of sinners. That's our Jesus. So in a moment, we're going to sing a song of worship reflecting on this Jesus. And after the song is over, uh, I'm going to be, I'm going to pray, and then I'll be up front. Um, Our uh, congregational care chaplain, Jared March, will be up front, and we'll have a couple elders up front. If there's anything you need prayer for after the service, come up here and find one of us. We'd love to to pray for you. If you are in, have, uh, if you, as you've been here this morning, you're thinking, I'd I'm really not sure where I stand with Jesus. I don't know if I actually am saved or born again or any of, the, any of that. Just come find us. We'd love to talk to you about that. See, I love the very next verse in Isaiah 42, right? What's, what's the response of all of this? Look at the very next verse, verse 10, or listen to it. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise From the end of the earth, you who go down to the sea and all that fills it, the coastlands and their inhabitants, let the inhabitants sing for joy. Would you stand up and let us sing for joy to our precious Jesus?